you believe that this morning, man, the only reason why that I'm not in hell tonight is because of Jesus Christ. The only reason why I hadn't threw in the towel and quit and blew my head off and put a rope around my neck and cut my wrist is because he won't fail me. Amen. He's there. He promised me he'd be there. As we go, I told Pastor Butch in my office this morning, this is my heart. I said, Pastor Butch, it scares me to death now to prepare a sermon. I said, Preacher, what are you talking about? Every single time in the past few months that we've started a series, we've had to live out what we've preached. We just started a spiritual warfare study on Sunday mornings, series on Sunday mornings. And Satan and hell and the demons of hell has unleashed a battle right here. And guess what, church? It's about it's gonna intensify. It's gonna get worse. But he's never failed us. And he's not gonna start failing us now. If we put our trust, here, here's the key, church, and this ain't got nothing yet done. It, listen, we're going to preach it anyway, amen? The problem is, if we hadn't put our hope and our trust in Him, if we hadn't built our life on the firm foundation, then everything else that comes into our life shakes us and it rocks us and, and, it, and it rocks our world. And, and then we get our focus and our eyes off Jesus and we put our focus on everything else and we fail to realize because we hadn't put it all in him that he is our firm foundation and he has never failed us yet. If there's been any failing done, we failed him. Amen. Take your Bible, turn to Jude. There's only one book in Jude. There's 27 verses, and, and we're going to look at three of those this morning. Lord will, and I told them last night, and I wasn't kidding. The sermon is so long this morning, I may not finish with three verses. But they're some, they some powerful, packed verses that we got to unpack here because you, as we go through today, especially leading into the weeks to come, remember this, we are contending for the faith. Everything that Jude wrote in Jude is leading to contending for the faith, okay? He unleashes that to us in, chapter, in verse 3, but everything that we're going to talk about this morning is lining us up, preparing us to contend for the faith. Don't stop fighting for the faith. If you would, stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. If you there, say, I'm there. Say he's never failed me yet. Amen. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, who's he writing to? Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of a common salvation of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints father we love you we thank you god would you bless the reading of your word and father would can we have lord a touch this morning may we have your anointing hide us behind the cross or they don't need to hear from a preacher they need to hear from your word Lord, they need to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Lord, as you've convicted us uh, through this message, God. And, and Lord, we pray that you receive praise, honor, and glory for anything that's done. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Don't stop fighting for the faith. Of all the things in this world that are worth fighting for, our family. Hey, would you fight for your family this morning? Our family, our kids, dreams ambitions, friends, careers, money, worth fighting for. 
The question that I have for us this morning, out of all those things listed, would, would your faith make the list of things this morning that's worth fighting for? Are you prepared this morning to fight for the faith? Or have you uh, determined, as, as those Old Testament Daniels tell us, that they had purposed in their heart? So this morning, have you purposed in your heart? Have you prepared? Uh, to fight for the faith. When do we fight for the faith? When, when do we contend? Uh, when do we do battle? Let me tell you this morning. When apostasy arises, when false teachers emerge in this world, listen, when the truth of God is attacked, it's time to stand up as a church of God and fight for the faith. Amen. Only believers, here it is, we've already alluded to it before we ever got ready to preach this morning. Only believers that are spiritually in shape can answer the bell for the fight. If you're not in spiritual shape this morning, you hadn't been training and you hadn't prepared your spiritual body for the fight, my friend, you can come out for the bell, but guess what's going to happen? It's going to be a first-round knockout, and you're going to get knocked out. The church of the living God and the believers uh, that are saved need to be preparing for the fight and preparing your soul. When Jude opens the book, he opens this letter. He focuses in on those believers with what? A common salvation. A common salvation. And he quickly challenges them to contend for the faith. We realize this morning that the danger is real, right? We established last week, I hope, that there's a battle coming. And, and that we're in a real fight, and the danger is real. Let's, let's walk through the book of Jude together and see how Jude prepares us for the fight. Now, this outline's a little different. I, I don't have a title for each sermon through this series. The whole thing is contending for the faith. Don't stop fighting for the faith. But the first thing I have for us, Jude gives us a, a word of salutation. That word salutation just simply means greeting. He gives us a, a word of greeting, but in that greeting is packed. He says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, served in Jesus Christ, called. Mercy unto you, peace, love, be multiplied. First of all, Jude tells us that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Now remember, we're leading up to contending for the faith. So it's important that if we're going to contend for the faith, that we be a servant of Jesus Christ. And Jude says right off the bat that he is a servant. That word servant in the Greek text simply, simply says doulos, okay? Doulos. And, and what it means is bond slave. Now, this is a little brought commentary to the pulpit with me real quick. But volume 3, page 117 of Weist Word Study says this about, about that word bond slave. It, it gives us five things that a bond slave means. First, let me say, it's a prisoner of love. But it all, Weist says that one who is bound to another, one who is born in slavery, one whose relationship can be broken only by death. You hear this, church? And one whose will, will, whose will is swallowed up by another, one who serves another even to discard of his own interest. Sounds to me like when Jude said, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, a bondservant, that the child of God in, it should be completely sold out to Jesus Christ. This gives us a word picture in, in a relationship of, of every born-again believer. Is what it is. That's a word picture for us. That This is every born-again child of God is what we should be. In the Old Testament, in the year of Jubilee, you know what happened, right? Uh, the slaves were set free. 
And, and, and if one was desired to remain with his master, he desired to stay in that master's household. They took him to the house, to the doorpost, and they took an awl, and they drilled through that man's ear to the doorpost. And from that point on, he was marked for life. Marked for life. He never, listen, he, this ought to bless the child of God this morning. You do realize that none of the Old Testament is useless, right? It, it's all giving us a picture of us in the future. Listen, when that man was marked for life, he was never guarded or chained again. <laughs> Woo! As a child of God this morning, I've been drilled through the ear, if you would, amen, and I am no longer in chains and bondage. I've been set free. You say, well, preacher, he was still a slave. Yeah, but he was a free slave. Guess what, child of God, this morning? you still a slave, but you've been set free. <laughs> he was never guarded or chained again. He, he was a free man who, who gladly served his master. Are you serving the master freely this morning and, and gladly? Listen, you say, preacher, what's this got to do with contending for the faith? If we're going to contend for the faith, then we better realize who we are this morning. He says his freedom has been surrendered and, and he's no longer, he, he was a prisoner, if you would, of love. You and I this morning should consider ourselves prisoners of love to Jesus Christ, our master. Paul confessed himself as a prisoner, didn't he? He served God gladly. You see, the cry of the natural man, the cry of us is, is liberation of life, man. we got to be liberated with, without any restraints, without anything on us. And, and men wants to be free from God. They want to be free from their conscience. And they want to be free from everything else. You see, but the answer to the dilemma this morning is not inhibited living, but it is, is rather unconditional surrender to God Almighty. Church, we need to be unconditionally surrendered to God if we're going to be able to contend for the faith. The Word of God is clear on this point. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, it says, And he that died for all, that which uh, live not should henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. In biblical, in biblical language, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. We are, we are to glorify God in our body and spirit. Can I say to us this morning, it's wrong for us to deny the Lord the use of our body? It's wrong for us to deny Him full control? It's wrong for us. Amen? And he, we, we are be, should be able to do with us what he pleases. And the servant should not desire to have better than the master had. We should be his. And Jude, as did the other apostles, identifies himself as a, as a bondservant or a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer here identifies himself as Jude the brother of James also. But did you notice that he didn't identify himself as the brother of Jesus? That's some humility right there, isn't it? He's, he's, he's the brother of Jesus, but he identifies himself as a servant of Jesus. That goes completely against what man today wants to do. But Jude, the brother of Jesus... 
James was the, the head of the church in Jerusalem, wasn't he? And was called James the Less. He is called the brother of the Lord in Galatians. And in, in the book of James in the New Testament, he bears his name. James and Jude were among the four brothers of the Lord according to Mark 6, 3. But here Jude shows some true humility and, 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 and as he goes through this book of not identifying himself as the brother. He doesn't make the claim that, that Jesus is my brother. Now, now I, I have to admit, okay, here's a man that rose, raised up people from the dead. He caused blind people to see and lame people to walk and cut the tongues out of loud mouth people, amen? No, he didn't really do that. He did tell us to lay our, yeah, anyway, yeah, let's move on. Here's a man that could do all those things. Brian's probably identifying with Jesus, okay? There's nothing wrong with identifying with Jesus, but our, 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 our motives has got to be right. Amen? And Jude's motives was right. He said, this thing about contending, it, it, it ain't about recognition for myself. It ain't about what, what the church can do for me, and it ain't about what, what, what they can do for me. It's about what I can do as a servant to Jesus Christ. And when we get into this thing of contending, our hearts better be in the right place. Jude was inspired by, he was not only the brother of James, but Jude tells us here that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit and writes to the saints. Now, we're going somewhere and you're probably going to ask another question. Why in the world has this got to do with contending? You do realize that in the day that we live in, that this book I hold in my hand, we're contending for. And Jude is saying, now listen, I wanted to write to you about something else. He says, he says I, but, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to the saints about something else. He says to them here in this passage of Scripture, to them refers to all who first of all have been sanctified by God the Father. He says, serve Jesus Christ, brother James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. This outline comes right out of the scripture, okay? He said, you got to be sanctified by God the Father. The word sanctified means what? To be cut off from or to be set apart for the purpose of God. To be cut off from or set apart for the purpose of God. It comes from the same root word as the word holiness. Some examples. Abraham and his seed was set apart. The tabernacle was set apart. The, 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 uh, the tithe was set apart. Uh, the Sabbath day was set apart. The born again person is different from the rest. They have been set apart. Jude says when we get ready, when he gets to the contend part, he says if we're going to contend and don't stop fighting for the faith, then we need to make sure that, that we've been sanctified and set apart. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying if you're faking it till you make it, you ain't going to make it. He's saying you better be true to the word. You better be genuine uh, to what the word of God says. He says you better be born again, blood-bought. Amen? He also says in that verse that, 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 that he's inspired to write to those who have been preserved in Jesus Christ. Y'all know I like pear preserves, fig preserves, and anything preserved. I ain't saying nothing about biscuits because I ain't eating them. Don't bring me none. I don't need none. If it ain't green in a shake or, or, or got protein in it, I can't have it. Amen? And don't bring me one because I probably ain't going to drink yours. I got to make my own. I love preserves. I can put preserves in my shake without the sugar. Listen, as child, children of God, Jesus said if we're going to contend, we better be among that number that's been preserved. The word preserved means to be kept in the state of wholeness, to protect. At the moment of salvation, we were placed in Christ. We were put into the body of Christ. And from the beginning to the end of our salvation, it is fully dependent upon him to keep us there. 
Say, preacher, really? Absolutely. Salvation is eternal and everlasting. We receive life from God. Amen? And, and it's for the ages. It's from everlasting to everlasting. God is God. We have his life in us. And if we got the life of Christ in us, we can't be dead. We got to be alive. It is, in, it is an act of God that's keeping us preserved. Do you realize this night you can't be half born or half saved? It ain't nighttime in case I keep saying it's night. It ain't nighttime. You can't be half saved or half born. Listen, don't cheapen. You hear me? Don't cheapen what God has done by saying that it can't last. If you say that it can't last, you're cheapening what Christ did for us on the cross and what he did when he rose up from the dead and came back to life. As a real, genuine, born-again person is saved forever. Five people believe that. I'm telling you, that I, I struggled with this all my whole life, didn't I, Gina? Listen, I was told, you know that, I could lose it. But listen to me, child of God. We're cheapening God's grace. And he says, it's forever when he saves us. And, and it's fully upon him. Praise God, it's not what I can do, but it's what he's done. And salvation is of the Lord this morning. We preserved. But man, there's something else here. He says in that verse, he says, not only are you preserved and sanctified, he says, but you're called. Say, preacher, only preachers are called. Wrong. Wrong. We're the called ones. Listen, it's the Holy Spirit that calls men from sin to salvation. Conviction, conviction is a prerequisite to being saved. A lost man has no desire to follow God. He does not seek God until the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of his heart and puts conviction of his lostness in his heart. God's Spirit shows man the need of salvation. He calls men to Christ, doesn't he? He calls the saints to a place and a position of service. Not only to salvation, he calls us when he saves us to a place of position and a place of service. This is illustrated for us in, in the Word of God. Listen, God himself called out Abraham. We're going to talk about Abraham tonight. He called out Abraham. Eleazar called out Rebekah for Isaac. Listen, Moses called out Israel out of Egypt. Jesus called out his disciples. And listen, the Holy Spirit calls out people, the bride of Christ, and we are the bride of Christ. We've been called out unto the Lord. But Jude has another desire here as he writes. He has a desire. Jude's desire for the saints is this. Mercy. Mercy unto you, verse 2. That's his desire for the saints. Is that is that, that mercy is is that which keeps us from God giving us what we deserve. <laughs> Woo! The child of God ought to say, Thank you, Jesus, for not giving me what I deserve. I'm gonna come down here and preach for a minute. Because if some of us got what we deserved, the way we lapped that tongue in our mouth, come on. Our tongue be beating our head to death, amen, if we got what we deserved. The way we tear people down with our tongues, come on. I'm going to preach to you whether you like it or not, amen. amen. The way we live our lives. Listen, if we got what we deserved tonight, can I tell you what we would get? Hey, some of you going home and saying, I got to wake up for the morning because it's nighttime. Listen, <laughs> it's daytime, y'all. Listen, if we got what we deserved We'd all be burning in the devil's hell right now. But thank God, mercy keeps us from getting what we deserve. And it's God not giving us what we deserve. The sinner deserves God's worst punishment. But mercy looks at us and it looks beyond, whoo, it looks beyond our faults and it sees our needs. 
<laughs> man, me and, Ryan, me and Ryan Getty got some faults, don't we, bro? And we talk about them, too, what makes it so bad. But you know what? God looks beyond those faults. He looks down there and looks at them two boys, and he says, mm, man, they need some help. I say, thank you, Jesus. We need a lot of it. Wait a minute. Who ain't men that back there? That's when you're supposed to sit there quietly, amen? <laughs> hey, look, we need Jesus' help. And if we got what we deserve, man, it, it, it would be awful. But by, by mercy, we get what God has designed for us and not what we deserve. He also says here, because we've got mercy, he says you got some peace. I'm glad I got peace because, listen, I'm going to stop after this point because we ain't got time to do the contending this morning, okay? We'll get it next week. Peace. Peace because of mercy. The result of receiving God's mercy is peace. You know what I got this morning? I, I'm okay with the mercy I got because I got peace. Now, there's some people struggling with guilt in the room this morning. You're struggling with, 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 with your past, okay? But if you're going to contend for the faith this morning, let me tell you what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to give that past to Jesus. Hmm? You're going to have to give it to Jesus because if you go into this fight carrying your past, it's going to weigh you down. Paul says, hey, some things you got to put off. you got to lay the weights down and press toward the mark of the high calling. So you got to put it aside, and man, you got to give it to Jesus. That we sung about the altar this morning, didn't we? That's what this altar is for: It's to bring them down here and leave them with Jesus, and get up and go back a changed person, realizing, hey, listen, God showed up and good to me. He showed me mercy, and I ain't got to deal with my past. I got peace in my heart when I get up from this altar because of the mercy that Jesus has gave me. Man, I thank God for His peace. We're no longer enemies. We're no longer enemies, church. Before you got saved, you was an enemy. But now you contending with the Savior who has gave you mercy and has gave you peace. But we have a reconciled, we've been reconciled unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been made right with Christ through Jesus Christ. You still notice it ain't got nothing to do with you, right? You don't have reconciliation with Christ today because of you. It's because of Christ Jesus. And now we enjoy the peace of God because we have peace with God. If you're struggling with peace today, maybe you don't have the peace of God in your heart because when you get the peace of God in your heart, you can have peace with him. And we need that peace going into this battle. He says something else here in this verse. He says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Ouch. He didn't say you got to love a little bit. He said, I want it multiplied. Mm. See, the love of God is, is shed abroad in the hearts by the Holy Ghost. You see, and when the child of God gets the mercy of God and the peace of God, then he wants to share the love of God with everybody else. You see, the recipients of God's love become the dispensers of that same love. So if we're going to contend for the faith, then we've got to have been sanctified. Amen? We've got to be called. We got to have the peace of God, the love of God, and the mercy of God. Number two, verse three. He says, Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of a common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Y'all listen quick. I'm going. The word describing God's family is beloved. It's used three times in the book of Jude. It's used in a, in a different way, in a peculiar way. It's used uh, uh, to address saved people. We, we are to accept. We are accepted uh, in the beloved. 
That makes us loved ones, if you would. That makes us the beloved of God. We are the loved ones of God. The, the person becomes a part of God's family only by birth. Remember, Jude is talking to people who are going to be contending for the faith. And that person, again, must be born again. The first birth of, of the flesh ruins us, <laughs> don't it? The, 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 the flesh ruins us, that first birth. But the second birth, that of the Spirit, redeems us. What ruined us, the Spirit and God comes along and redeems us, the beloved. It is those who have the second birth or, or, or who have been born again that this epistle of Jude is addressing. Jude speaks of a common salvation. It's common, but it's not cheap. He don't mean a cheap salvation. But it's common. It's common because it's available to all. <laughs> what does all mean? All means all, and that's all all means. It's common to all. The Word of God's clear, amen? It's clear. Jesus, and I'm going to quit after this, I promise. Jesus died for all, and all who come to him can be saved. Can somebody say Amen. Victor, I sure am glad God saves ever who will, aren't you? Yes, man, welcome to the family, brother. I'm glad Jack, hey, man, Jack, God even saved Jack, amen? <laughs> James said, I don't know how. <laughs> Listen, Jesus, God, it's a whosoever salvation. If, you, you, if you're here and you're a Calvinist, go ahead and put your earplugs in. Those who preached limited atonement are preaching contrary to the very plain fact of the Word of God. I say that the idea of limited atonement is a mockery uh, to the blood-stained old rugged cross. This one is, this is one of the main points of hyper Calvinism, and it's that we are, are totally incapable, it's, it's, it's not even compatible with the Bible. It's not. The, 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 these people have failed to recognize that the foreknowledge of God and the foreordination or nation of man are not synonymous with each other. God knew from the beginning and from the end. He knew from the beginning who would be saved and who would not be saved. To deny that says that God is not omniscient or all-wise or all-knowing. But to say that he made a choice to, to who would be saved and who would not is a plain contradiction to the fact that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The offer of salvation is made to whosoever will. God wants all men to be saved. And it's not the will of God that any man should perish, but that they all should come into repentance. And we must not blame God for wrong, nor should we throw the responsibility of choice uh, between heaven upon, and hell upon God. It's a choice of man. Man is a creature of choice. God did not create us to be robots. He don't want us to be robots God gave Noah the plans to build the ark didn't he and it, but Noah still had to go out there and cut the timber and build the ark or he would have drowned it like everybody else God gave him the plan but he still had to fulfill the plan we are listen if we are higher than the animals and lower than the angels and we have an awesome responsibility of choosing whom we will receive or who we will serve. And the wonderful thing about the gift of salvation is it's available to all. It's available to all. It is common because we're all saved the same way. I'm going to speed through this point because I'm trying to really get finished. 
we're all saved the same way. This, is, this again blows out. There's multiple ways to heaven out the window. Okay, there's two ways. There's two ways. One leads to heaven, one leads to destruction. Amen. Wide is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to heaven. And if you're going to heaven, you must, you must, you must. There's no way around it. You can't get by it. You must come through the blood of Jesus Christ. You must accept the fact that, that, hey, listen, he says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. If this blood was not shed, my friend, and it ain't talking about Muhammad's, and it's not talking about fat guy Buddha, and it's not talking about Allah or no other person, it's talking about the son of the precious lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. He shed his blood for all mankind. And listen this morning, he died for all, and we all get saved the same way. And it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thus, on the authority of Scripture, we conclude that there is only one way in which God saves sinners. And he tells us about it right here. It's a common salvation. And it's available to all on the same basis. My last thing this morning is constrained of the Spirit. Jude says that, that it was under the constraint of the Spirit that he wrote this epistle. The word constraint means is translated that, that it was needful or necessary. Jude was literally constrained to write what he wrote. The testimony of Jude is, is, is the Holy Spirit, if you would, made me write this. This gives deep meaning for us of the, the, the full verbal, full inspiration of Scripture. It's been described as the day in which we live in as the battle for the Bible. We're living in the day of the battle for the Bible. And we need to know that the Holy Spirit used constrained upon holy men to write the Word of God. Listen, we're going into a battle that, that we're fighting, and the Holy Spirit has given us the battle plans. And listen, we can trust the Word of God, but we must have prepared ourselves to trust the Word of God. The Baptist Courier wrote an article in July 21, 1977. Yes, it's old. It was two pages long from Furman University, page 8 and 9 of that carrier, and he quotes this, Robert Bra uh, Broucher, chief translator of the Good News Bible in today's English version, is quoted of saying, the Old Hebrew Trans uh, Testament in uh, the Old yeah, Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament were not, y'all, there's a reason why they're not one of our Baptist colleges anymore, by the way. They were not written by God, but by people. They had their own peculiarities, point of view, and shortcomings. You see enough of truth mixed in here already? He says, but they were enabled to perceive God's presence in the events of the day and were led to preserve it. Concerning his belief about Jesus Christ, he says, the most damaging effect of neglect of the Old Testament by Christians is that Jesus is no longer a Jew. He was stripped of his race, culture, and religion, uh, bereft of his roots. Jesus is dehumanized. He becomes universal man. He goes on to say, the Bible is not a divine book. It was there, and it was in, uh, if it were, it would be... Huh. The Bible is not a divine book. If it were, it would be irrelevant. I'm not going to read the rest of it because I heard enough to be nauseated. That was in our Baptist Courier in 1977. Now, that was back when we were headed liberal and we turned this thing around with Adrian Rogers' help, amen. But we need another turning around. These people teach that God simply impregnated the men's minds of men with ideas that they were free to express these ideas as they pleased. Jude just blew that out of the water when he said, I wanted to write unto you about a common salvation, but the Holy Spirit says, and hey, boy, here's something else you've got to write about. Write to them fellows down there today and those that's going to be living in 2024 when the heat's getting hot, that they got to preach the inerrant, infallible Word of God. Listen, the Word, uh, 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 
uh, Gnostic means this, knowledge or wisdom. The alpha uh, primitive of that is in, in, uh, in front of its, uh, neglects the, it neglects the word. Therefore, the contradiction of the words agnostic or agnostic, uh, those who uh, classify themselves as such are declaring themselves to be professors of ignorance. How tragic it is to live and die in ignorance when we have the Bible in front of us that tells us and gives us the truth of God. I'm convinced that those uh, in our day, they're, they're getting fewer in number that believes that the Bible is fully inspired of God. I'm persuaded. And I've always believed, I've always preached that this I believe now and this I believe when I get to heaven that God's word is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. And Jude tells us right here in the last, next to the last book that it is. Glory be to God that without apologies, without apologies and anyone believing anything less then this is not a Christian in the New Testament sense of the word. And I am not going to judge you. I'm just stating the message of the New Testament itself. The Bible is God's inspired word. Listen, whether you believe it or not, don't change the fact that it's God's word. He settled it. Amen. Stephanie, if you would come. Listen this morning, preacher. What are you trying to tell us? What are you trying to tell us? I would have never known about the Savior's love had it not been for this precious book. Church, we got something to contend for today. The Word of God. And without any shame or without any apologies, I love the Bible. I respect, matter of fact, I respect the Bible and love it so much. If you ever lay anything on top of my Bible, you might be missing some teeth. I love the Bible. It's God's Word. I read the Bible. I accept the Bible. I preach the Bible. I try my dead level best to live the Bible, and I'll take my stand beside the Bible. Come hell or high water, I'm going to stand on the Word of God. There's a bunch of Jericho's little brothers running around here. You know who Jericho was, right? He took the pen of the Word and started cutting out pages and throwing them in the fire. Were well, they running around in our day saying, it don't mean that. It don't mean this. They're trying to, uh, uh, they're trying to cut the Word of God apart and destroy the word of God but this little book of Jude gives us great hope that the child of God can stand on the word of God if you would stand heads bowed and eyes closed hey this morning listen let's contend let's don't quit fighting I don't know about you man but I don't come too far to quit now <laughs> Ryan we too close to home brother we too close to home I can almost hear the trumpet sound. I can almost hear Jesus say, "Son, God, he say, son, go get my children. I don't know about you, but when I hear contend for the faith, this is what I hear. Finish well. Finish well. Rick, finish well, brother. Finish well. Church, finish well. Finish well.